Bruchim Haboyim to our new series of classes on Hilchis Kiddush HaChaydesh LeHarambam. I'm Rabbi Yossi Lipsker from Sherman Oaks, California, and Be'ezra Hashem, after listening to these shiurim, you will confidently be able to learn, to understand, and perhaps even to find a new enjoyment in these complex halachas. For some reason, Kiddush HaChaydesh has come to be labeled as one of those areas of Torah that's just too difficult to understand. It's true, in the Machzor of Shlesha Prakim LeHarambam, we get less than a week to learn all of these 19 Prakim, many of which are loaded prakim. It's also true that a basic understanding of astronomy and mathematics is required to understand the halachas. But once you do understand the core issues at hand, it's really not as hard as people think it is. And I hope, sincerely, that uh, these classes will facilitate making Hilchas Kiddush HaChadosh more easily accessible and understandable. The structure of the classes is not going to be text-based. I'm not reading the halachas of the Ramam inside al Seder. Instead, I'm going to discuss the concepts, the principles, the premises that the Rambam assumes throughout these halachas so that you can master and comprehend it, learning inside on your own. So, without further ado, let's get right to it. Just before I begin, I would like to mention Rabbi Mendel Deren, who has some incredible 3D diagrams that he's created on Hilchas Kiddush HaChadosh, and he was gracious enough to allow me to use some of his material in the slideshow that I will present throughout this year. Before we actually begin with the Rambam, let's cover some basics. Some basics that have nothing to do specifically with Hilchas Kedosh HaChedosh, but are a stepping stone to really understanding the core of these halachas. Let's first talk about circles. A circle has no beginning and no end. So if you want to identify the position of a given object along a circle, you have a dilemma. How do you label where an object is? What if you have two objects on a circle and you want to label the angular distance between them? How do you explain where one is relative to the other? So for this reason, a circle mathematically is divided into what's called 360 degrees. The Rambam's word for this is milus. One mile is one degree, two milus, etc. 360 degrees. Take example, the slide. You have zero degrees as the top of the circle and you can see that the sun is on 10 degrees. Take a look at this slide here, you see both the sun and the moon on the circle. The sun is at 10 degrees, the moon is at 90 degrees. The angular distance between them can now be identified as 80 degrees. Degrees, as the Ramam explains them, can further be divided, for the sake of precision, into minutes, or chalakim. Each maila can be divided into 60 chalakim. Each minute can be divided into 60 seconds. Each second can be divided into 60 thirds. These are not minutes and seconds of time, they're minutes and seconds in space. Another important point about circles is that since a circle is circular, once you reach 360, you just go back to zero. So if, for the purposes of a certain calculation, we were saying that something traveled along the circle 400 degrees, that means that it completed a full revolution, 360 degrees plus another 40, we don't say anymore that this object traveled 400 degrees. We just say it traveled 40 degrees. Because once you hit 360, that number 360 becomes irrelevant. This concept is discussed in the Rambam many times as she'edis. She'edis means a remainder. Whenever you have a certain number and you're looking to find the number that's relevant to your calculation, sometimes you'll have to throw away complete units. Like in, in the case of degrees, once you reach 360, you just throw that away and whatever number is left between 0 and 360 is the relevant one that you want to hold on to. Now that we've talked about circles, let's talk a little bit about spheres. A sphere is a 3D circle, or in English we call that simply a ball. Every sphere has an axis, poles, and an equator. And I'm going to explain each of these terms. The axis is the imaginary line that runs from the top of the circle to the bottom of the circle. Now, of course, a ball has no top and bottom, but when you're labeling it for mathematical purposes that here's the top and here's the bottom, the line that imaginarily runs from the top to the bottom is called the axis. If the ball were to rotate in place, the expression would be it would be rotating around its axis. The two ends of the axis are called poles, the top pole and the bottom pole or if they're in certain directions, like in the case of Earth, the North Pole and the South Pole. The equator is the midpoint between the two poles. It's the line that wraps around the belly, the thickest part of the sphere. 
And the equator essentially divides the sphere into two. That's what we call in English a hemisphere. So if we applied everything I just said to Earth, the poles, like I said before, would be the North Pole and the South Pole. The line between them would be the axis. And the equator would be the line at the midpoint of Earth that runs along east to west, which creates, as we know them today, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, the top half of the world and the bottom half. Another point of introduction is how we define time in Halacha. For the purposes of Ilchas Kiddush HaChaydash, nighttime is exactly 12 hours, and daytime is also exactly 12 hours. So the night begins at 6 p.m. and ends at 6 a.m. The day begins at 6 a.m. and ends at 6 p.m. Together, we have a day. What emerges is that a day is 24 hours. So when I label that something happens on a certain hour of the day, the count always begins from 6 p.m. the night before that day. So if you come across in these halachas, three hours on Tuesday. Three hours on Tuesday doesn't mean like you might think three hours into the morning of Tuesday. It means three hours after 6 p.m. on Monday night, i.e. Monday night, 9 p.m. If you come across the expression 16 hours on Thursday, again, you start from 6 p.m. on Wednesday night and you reach Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Another point about time is that conventionally, we divide hours into minutes and seconds. One hour is 60 minutes, each minute is 60 seconds. In Halacha, in the Chaskidash HaChaydash, an hour is simply divided into 1,080 units of time. They're called Chalakim. If you wanted to equate it to modern time, each Chalak is a three and a third seconds. 1,080 Chalakim. We pick this number as the Ramam explains because it's mathematically convenient. It's divisible by every number one through 10 and their multiples. Like the number 360 is also divisible by every number one through 10 but it's not divisible by a multiple of that. For example, if you took seven times six, that equals 42. 360 is not divisible by 42, but 1,080 is. The same thing with nine times three equals 27. 360 is not divisible by 27, but 1,080 is. So therefore, it's the best number, and we divide every hour into 1,080 chalakim. Just like I mentioned before, there's the concept of she'edis in space, that once you reach the end of the circle, that number 360 degrees just goes away so too in time. If any time your calculation leads to a number more than 1,080 chalakim, you just convert the 1,080 chalakim into an hour. If your hours accumulate to the number 24, well, 24 hours just turn into a day. And sometimes calculations might require you to look at the days of the week, in which case every time you hit seven days, you just throw away the group of seven days because seven days brings you right back to the same point in the week. So we've covered some introductory concepts that are relevant as a stepping stone to these halachas. Now we're ready to move on to the Rambam itself. However, before we deal with Kiddush HaChaydash, let's first talk about some things that the Rambam discusses in Hilchis Yesoide HaToyra, Peter Gimel, which are also very, very important to know before you begin Hilchis Kiddush HaChaydash. Science today believes in what's called the heliocentric model. That means that the universe has at the center of it the sun, and all the planets, including Earth, orbit around the sun. However, the Rambam rules very clearly, in Hilchas Seyda Atayra, Pere Gimel Halacha Dalet, that the Earth is in the center of the universe. That's called the geocentric model. All the planets, the sun, moon, stars, and everything, are orbiting around the Earth. Of course, this matches what we learn in Chassidus, at the Tachlis of creation was, In other words, the be-all, end-all of everything is in this world. And so it matches that the physical reflection of this should be in the phenomenon that the earth is in the center of everything. The Rambam further tells us in Hilchus Yusei De Atayra there, that there is an invisible galgal, an invisible sphere that encompasses all of existence. And every 24 hours, it revolves a full 360 degrees around the earth clockwise. That means from east to west. And it takes all of existence along with it. It's a constant manifestation of the Eberster's infinity. This Galgal is called the Galgal Hayoimi, the daily Galgal, for that reason. Because every day, every 24 hours, it completes a full revolution around the earth. The daily revolution of the Galgal Hayoimi, by the way, is the reason for our experience 
of sunrise and sunset each day. In the diagram over here, you can see that the planets are orbiting around the Earth sideways. Of course, we observe the sun and the moon every day climbing upwards and then descending downwards, sunrise and sunset. But that's because in the diagram, we're looking at it from the viewpoint of somebody standing on the North Pole of the Earth. And therefore, his horizon, the viewpoint that you can see, the half of the heavens that are visible to you, are from that perspective where the sun and moon go around this way. However, to us, standing in America, we're much closer to the equator, and therefore it's as though, imagine the Earth tilted on its side. With America on top, the planets would then be circling this way, in an upwards and downwards motion, which is why we view it as sunrise and sunset. The sunrise and sunset is by the force of the Galgal Hayemi, which is pushing all of existence from east to west. However, the Rama makes it clear that while the Galgal Hayemi is pushing everything from east to west, the sun and the moon, truth is all the planets as well, but for these halachas, only sun and moon are relevant. The sun and the moon are each contained in their own individual Galgal, their own individual sphere, which is moving them at a much slower pace from west to east, counterclockwise. Both movements are happening simultaneously, so that each day, the sun and the moon are essentially moving in two directions. By the force of the Galgal Hayoimi, they're being spun 360 degrees westward, from east to west. But by the force of their own Galgal, in their own orbit, they're moving much less west to east. And you can think of it like a guy on a ship, where the ship is speeding westward, and the guy on deck is walking eastward. So even if the ship goes 500 feet in one direction, because the man has walked 25 feet in the other direction, essentially, he has only moved 475 feet. What is the pace of the sun and the moon in their own orbits? The Ramam gives it to us in the beginning of Perek Yud and in the beginning of Perek Yud Dalet of Ilchus Kiddush HaChedesh. The sun moves approximately one degree per day. And the moon moves approximately 13 degrees per day. We'll get the exact numbers when we get to the classes on those prakim. And again, at the risk of sounding repetitive, what this means is the sun and the moon essentially aren't completing a full revolution each day. While the Galgal Hayoimi is pushing everything 360 degrees, but they've crawled backwards one degree or 13 degrees in the case of the moon. By the way, without getting too uh, complex, while it's certainly true of the moon that the moon is not completing the revolution of the Galgal Hayoimi, some say that the sun actually is. And they suggest that the Galgal Hayoimi's revolution actually goes 361 degrees, so that the sun basically comes back to the same position every day. But that point aside, at any rate, we have the Galgal Hayoimi pushing everything one direction, and we have the sun and the moon being pushed in the other direction. Now, a very, very important clarification needs to be made. The Galgal Hayoimi's revolution is from what we call due east to due west. That means it's the same orientation as the Earth, just like the Earth is suspended straight, north on top, south on bottom, and the equator runs directly east to west, the Galgal Hayoimi turns everything exactly along that plane, from due east to due west. However, the Sun and the Moon's orbit, where they're going the other way from west to east, is not directly parallel to that. It's not like they're going backwards from due west to due east. Instead, their orbit is inclined at 23.5 degrees relative to the equator, which means they're going around the world essentially like a diagonal ring, up and down. At points, they're higher than the equator. At points, they're lower than the equator. By the way, the groups of stars you see in this picture are the mazolis, the constellations. They're groups of stars, clusters of stars essentially, identified by the early sages to serve as the backdrop for the sun and the moon's movement, right? Movement can only be measured relative against something else. So how do we know where the sun and the moon are? So the Chachamim identified Kechavim, different groups of stars, and together basically created a belt that's called the Galgal Hamazoles, or the ecliptic in English, along which the sun and the moon can be said to be moving. So when we say the sun goes one degree, it's traveled one degree in the Galgal Hamazoles, two degrees, three degrees, 30 degrees, etc. Every group of stars accounts for 30 degrees of the circle, so that 12 times 30 equals 360. 
because of this inclination, we can understand why there are different seasons in the year. You see, the sun is slowly climbing from zero degrees towards 90 degrees, at which point it's at its most northerly inclination relative to the equator. At that point, when the Galgal Hayoimi is doing its thing, turning all of existence from east to west, it's still turning the sun as well, but the sun is now turning at a higher level. Same thing when the sun climbs downwards to the southerly part relative to the equator. It's still turning from due east to due west by the force of the Galgal Hayoimi, but now it's turning on the lower southern hemisphere. And because of that, because at some parts in the year the sun is closer to the northern hemisphere, and other parts in the year the sun is closer to the southern hemisphere, it's summer in one place and winter in the other. Here in North America, we're in the northern hemisphere. During these months, it's the summer. And later on, after Tishrei, will be the winter, when for us, the sun will be southerly to us. In the southern hemisphere, that's when the sun will be near them, so summer takes place then, and now it's the winter. Let's take all this information that we have and see how it impacts our calendar, the Jewish calendar. And let's start with explaining the concept of the Moilat. We said that the moon orbits around the earth at 13 degrees per day on its own orbit, going west to east. So take this picture, for example. You can see the sun and the moon are both aligned at zero degrees. If they started both at zero degrees, as they were at the time of creation, after one day, what would happen is you would see the sun has progressed by one degree. The moon has progressed by 13 degrees with a difference between them of 12 degrees. After two days, the distance is bigger. The sun has traveled one more degree. The moon has traveled another 13. Now there's a difference of 24 degrees between them. After three days, the distance continues. And you notice after 27 days, the moon has made a complete revolution around the earth. It's reached 360 degrees. However, that's not enough to call it a month because in those 27 days, the sun has advanced 27 degrees. And it's going to take another two and a half days approximately for the moon to catch up and once again be in alignment with the sun. That moment when the moon and sun are aligned is called the moilat, or conjunction in English. The word moilat comes from the word birth, because essentially when the moon gets aligned with the sun, it loses its light. And after it continues its journey, its light is again reborn. So the concept of moilat is created. The Rambam tells us that the time between one moilat and the next is exactly, gives us the exact number, 29 days, 12 hours, and 793 halakim. 29 and a half days and 793 parts of the 1080 that make up an hour. Vihi chadsha shel levona, as the Rambam says, that is a lunar month. Which essentially means that if you knew, for example, that a certain month's moilad took place in the morning, the next moilad is going to happen 29 days later, but then plus 12 hours. So it's going to be in the evening and so on and so forth. Notice, by the way, in the picture here that the Mailud does not mean the sun and the moon are returning to their original position. They both started off at zero degrees. Now their alignment is taking place at around 29 or 30 degrees. Mailud simply means that the sun and moon are in alignment relative to a person who would be looking out at them from the earth against the backdrop of the Gagal Hamazolis. As the Ramam explains, since one Mailud to the next has an exact specific number of days and hours between them, if you know the info for a given moilad, you can deduce mathematically when the next moilad will be. It's just simply easy. You just add 29 days, 12 hours, 793 halakim, and you have it. When was the first moilad though? How do we know when to start counting from? So the Rambam tells us the first moilad was Baharad, Bez, He, Reish, Dalad, which means Bez, Monday, He, five hours into Monday, which means 11 p.m. on Sunday night. Reish Dalad Chalakim, 204 Chalakim. This number is Allah Chalam Eishem Sinai. We know that was the first Mailad. Now understand that uh, in Sheshes and Meberishis, the sun and moon only began to function on a Tuesday night. So what does it mean that on a Sunday night there was a Mailad? This is called Mailad Toihu, the Mailad that predates creation. It's only there for theoretical, mathematical purposes. It's not an actual Mailad, according to the person that holds that the world was created in Tishrei, this Mailad is from the year before creation. According to the Manda Amar that creation was in Nisan, this is the Mailad six months before creation. 
But either way, the first method for all co computations and all calculation purposes is Sunday night, 11 p.m., 204 chalakim. Of course, knowing the Maylid is very important because it's the basis for how Rish Chedesh is decided. Today with our fixed calendar, you can see, you can take a look in the Siddur, Rish Chedesh is always on the day or the day after the Maylid, with some exceptions for Rosh Hashanah, as the Ramam explains at length in Perik Zayin of these halachas. And when Rosh Chedesh, certainly when Rosh Chedesh was decided by Beisdin, by the Iyasa Edim, when witnesses saw the new moon, Beisdin had to know when the Maylid would be so they could determine whether or not the moon would be visible that night. I want to just pause and explain what that means for a second. See, the Maylid is a moment in time. It's the moment when the moon once again realigns with the sun. But it's only a moment. The second after the Maylid, the moon is continuing its journey past and away more eastward from the sun. Since the Galgal Ayemi is pushing everything from east to west, that means sunset later on in the day is going to happen. The sun's going to dip below the horizon, but the moon will set after the sun because it's already had time to get further away from the sun. The question is, is there enough time? Has enough time elapsed from the time of the Maylid till the next Shkia Sachama for the moon to be visible in the sky before it sets on the horizon as well? So for example, if the Maylid happened at 12 p.m., so of course there isn't enough time in six hours, the moon can't move far enough away from the sun. The sun will set, there will be a time when the moon will be in the sky and not the sun, but that won't be enough time for the moon to become visible. The crescent is so small. If, let's say, the Maylid happened the night before, literally an hour after Shkia, 7 p.m., well then in 23 hours, the moon has a lot of time to travel away from the sun. There's a higher chance that the sun will set the next night and the moon will still be in the sky long enough for it to be observed by Adam. And again, this depends on, first of all, knowing when the Maylid was. Of course, it's not only dependent on when the Maylid was. There's much more complex cheshbainis, trigonometric cheshbainis, geometric cheshbainis, which the Ramam explains in Prakim Aleph, Yud Aleph to Yutes of these halachas, but it all begins with knowing the Maylid. And that's why knowing the Maylid is so important. Another thing which emerges from the above discussion is that now we can appreciate why the Yiddish calendar has leap years. Every couple of years, we add a second Adar. Why is that? The sun, moving one degree per day, west to east, takes 365 days and a quarter, which means 365 days and six hours, to complete a revolution around the earth. If our calendars were guided completely by the sun, we had a solar calendar, then each year would be 365 days, plus every four years we'd add one more day to make up for the, all the quarter days that accumulated, which is exactly, by the way, how the, how the secular calendar is built. It's 365 days, and every four years we get a February 29th. In that case as well, we would have to understand that months are just arbitrary. Nothing specific happens to the sun after 30 or 31 days. The only significant unit in time for the sun is the year when it completes its revolution around the earth. The fact that a solar year is divided into 12 months is simply arbitrary. But that would be a solar year. Of course, the Yiddish calendar does not follow the sun. Yisrael meinu no levana. You didn't count according to the moon, as the Ebesha told Meish and Mitzrayim, HaChedesh hazel lachem reish chadashim. This new moon will be the way that you determine new months. However, we can't just say that the Yiddish calendar only follows the moon. In other words, we'll just make 12 lunar months into a year. Because it takes 354 days for the moon to make 12 revolutions around the earth. That's about 11 days less than a solar year. Since the seasons of the year are dictated by the sun, as we explained before, that means that by the time a lunar year finishes, the sun still has 11 days to complete the fourth season. If right after day 354, we would start day one of the second lunar year, that would mean the second lunar year is beginning still in the fourth season of the sun. If we continued following that track, the second lunar year would end with 22 days before the solar year. And so on and so forth, the lunar year would get progressively earlier and earlier on the solar calendar, which would mean that any day in the lunar calendar could begin to be in any season. In fact, the Ibn Ezra writes that the Muslim calendar, which is totally lunar, therefore observes Ramadan on a different time each year. 
because they only have a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar will get progressively earlier and earlier relative to the solar calendar. Why is that a problem for the Jewish people? Because we have a special mitzvah, Shomer Yeshchei Aviv. Pesach needs to fall out in the spring, which means Tesvav Nisan has to fall out after the sun has once again entered zero degrees on its path. So we have a conundrum. How do we go with a lunar calendar but make sure that Pesach stays in the spring? Well, the simple answer would be to make our years 12 months and 11 days. Let the moon go around the earth 12 times. And those 11 days that are remaining will count as a mini month. And then we'll start the next year after 11 days. Well, the Rambam says that's an impossibility. We have Allah Lameshim Sinai, Chadoshim Atamayna Lashanim. You have to have a year made up of full months. No such thing as half months. So, what do we do? Says the Rambam, Chachamim enacted Shanam Me'uberes, an Ibriyar, a leap year. Every couple of years, as the differential between the solar and lunar years accumulates to enough time, we add a 13th month into our lunar year. And that compensates for the difference between the solar and lunar calendars and keeps all the Hebrew dates in their right seasons. How often does a leap year happen? Well, let's do the math. The Rambam says in every 19 years, it happens seven times. Here's how it goes. After one year, you have an 11-day difference between the sun and the moon years. After two years, you have a 22-day difference. Still not enough for a month. After three years, now you have 33 days difference. Well, you can take 30 of those days and convert them into a 13th month. Hence, the third year becomes a Shana Mu'uberes. You still have three days left over. So, after the fourth year, we have 11 days from that year plus the three days left over. That's 14 days difference. After the fifth year, we now have 25 days difference. After the sixth year, we have a 36 day difference. Well, 30 of those days can be converted into a month. The sixth year becomes a Shana Mu'uberes, but now we have six days of rollover. So pay attention to what happens now. In the seventh year, those 11 days combine with the six and we have 17 days remainder. And in the eighth year, we have 28 days remainder. Even though that's not yet enough for 30, we make the eighth year an Ibriyar and we get two days ahead. Now that we have two days ahead, two days of credit, so to speak, for the ninth year, the ninth year only leaves the solar calendar ahead by nine days. The 10th year now brings it to 20 days and the 11th year brings it to 31 and the 11th year becomes an Ibriyar. So too does the 14th, so too does the 17th, and so too does the 19th. If you follow the math that Ambam tells us, after 19 years, the solar and the lunar calendars will pretty much completely align. And I want to just spell out the math for a second. 19 solar years, that means 19 times 365 and a quarter equals 6,939 days and three quarters of a day, 18 hours. 19 lunar years, where 12 of them are 12 months and seven of them are 13 months for a total of 235 lunar months. 235 lunar months, 29 days, 12 hours, 793 halakim times 235 equals the same number of days, 6,939 days, and not 18 hours, but 16 hours and 595 halakim. That's a difference of just one hour and 485 halakim. That's less than an hour and a half. So every 19 years, the solar and lunar calendars align to a tiny differential of one and a half hours. Now, of course, that differential does accumulate. 19 years sounds like a long time, but once you go 19 years 10 times and then 19 years 100 times, 1900 years, that's a lot of hours of, uh, of a discrepancy. The Ramam deals with that later on. In Pedic Yud, we'll discover there's a different method of counting the solar year, whereby every 19 years it completely aligns. But for the purposes of our discussion, at the end of 19 years, we have a beautiful combination of the solar and lunar calendars. This is called a machzer, a complete cycle. And through us making leap years and incorporating leap years into our calendar, we're able to fulfill both conditions of the Torah, a lunar calendar, and Pesach in the spring. And as the Ramam states in the opening line of the Kedosh HaChadosh, our Chadashim, our months, are Chadshi HaLevana, and our Shanim, our years, are Shnei HaChama, our solar years. That's as far as structuring years. Just to close up, the Ramam in Pedic Ches discusses at length how we structure months. It takes 29 and a half days for the moon to make a revolution around Earth. So when does the one month end and the next month begin? Again, we would think, make a month 29 and a half days. 
no can do. The same way there's Allah Chalamayshim Yisina that you have to have years made up of months, you also have Allah Chalamayshim Yisina that months have to be made up of full days. No such thing as making a 29 and a half day month. So, for this reason, today in our fixed calendar, we alternate. One month is 29 days, the next month is 30. Because if you think about it, 29 and a half plus 29 and a half is 59. So if one month is 29 and one month is 30, you have 59 days. Now it's true, there's an extra 793 chalakim that have to be accounted for that accumulate from month to month, which is why, as the Ramam explains, we don't have a set alternating schedule where every month is either 29 or 30. Most months are set, but Cheshvan and Kislev themselves alternate. Some years they're both 29 days, some years, one's 29 and one is 30, and other years, both are 30. And that helps us adjust for all the discrepancies that those extra 793 halakim can cause. This concludes our introductory lesson to Hilchas Kedosh HaChedosh, and Be'ezras Hashem in the next classes, we'll cover Al-Seydar HaRambam, the more complex prakim.